All God's people said. Go ahead, turn with us to Mark chapter 13. So for the past two weeks, we've been in Mark chapter 13, and we've been interpreting this entire chapter based upon the clues given in the text that these things were referring to situations, people, places, nouns, names that were taking place in the first century and that the events described in Mark chapter 13 were correlating to what would happen 40 years later after Jesus with the destruction of Jerusalem. I've had no small shortage of questions after, especially last Sunday, asking me, well, is this chapter not talking about the end of time? Not just the end of Jerusalem, but is it talking about the end of time? And to that I would say, yes and no. It is talking about the end of Jerusalem, which as far as the Jewish mindset was concerned, was the end of the world as they knew it. Avery just read those verses earlier about peace of Jerusalem. The entire Old Testament was about The covenant promise given to Abraham that if you follow these laws, you inherit the land and you will be prosperous in the land. But the old covenant was a conditional covenant because if you did not follow the laws, guess what? You did not get the prosperity. And so even though that Psalm 122 says pray for peace in Jerusalem, guess what? There was only a few short years where actually peace was in Jerusalem in the entire Old Testament. Once the monarchy was established by King David, it went downhill from there. If you've read the Old Testament, say amen. The the kingdom divided. There were bad kings in the north. The ten tribes in the north, they were, I mean, they completely lost their mind. Uh, Erecting uh, poles to Asherah and and false gods and and (laughs) sacrificing to false gods. And then the, the southern kingdom, Judah, after David, it just, it just continually went downhill. So there wasn't peace in Jerusalem. And the thing is, once Jesus steps on the scene, and from Mark chapter 9 through 11 and 13, he is proclaiming that the time of prosperity in Jerusalem is coming to an end. And so much of what we see was fulfilled in the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. But... I learned a new theological term while studying for this series past three weeks. This chapter is a prolepsis, meaning it's describing something that will take place soon, which also foreshadows something that will take place in the future. So there's a big theological word, but all it means is something did take place shortly after that is a shadow of what will happen in the future. If you're tracking with me, say amen. So what I want to show you today is that the the language that Jesus was using in the destruction of the temple and in Mark chapter 13 is is not new language. It was actually all taken from the Old Testament referring to the destruction of Jerusalem. So I want to try to reiterate the fact that Jesus specifically, specifically is talking about when a city or a nation comes under the judgment of God. So, if you're in Mark 13, say a word. And we're going to start in verse 24. But in those days, after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will be falling from heaven, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. And then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. From the fig tree, learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts out its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gates. And verse 30 is really our interpretive key for this entire chapter. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away. Until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But concerning that day or that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard, keep awake, for you do not know when the time will come. It's like a man going on a journey when he leaves and puts his servants in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. 
Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come in the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows, or in the morning, lest he come suddenly and find you asleep. And what I say to you, I say to all, stay awake. May God bless the reading of his word. So, there's an interpretive theme that everyone misses here, and that is all of the events described, persecution, tribulation, The abomination of desolation. All of these things described are literally the worst things you could possibly imagine. They are the worst things you can possibly imagine in the history of the world. But what does Jesus say in verse 27? And I will gather my elect from the four winds. My friends, so here's our big idea. When everything is falling apart, Jesus still wins. I don't know if anyone's here today. When life around you is crumbling down, Jesus is still the sovereign king in control. Jesus does not lose when things get bad. Jesus does not lose when the abomination of desolation shows up. Jesus does not lose when cities are destroyed. Matter of fact, Jesus is the one prophesying their judgment. The tribulation is not Satan's scheme to uh, steal people from the church. I heard about a pastor this week. Well, I I call him a pastor. He's he's not a pastor anymore. Never should have been. He wrote a book uh, 20 years ago called I I Kiss Dating Goodbye. Anybody heard of that book? Uh, Good, you shouldn't have read it. Um, Wrote this book, I Kiss Dating Goodbye, named Joshua Harris. And, uh, and it really sent a lot of shockwaves because basically what he was saying is that um, Christians shouldn't date. Now, I understand his sentiment, but sometimes you've got to get to know someone <laughs> before you want to spend the rest of your life with them. Okay, and what he's talking about courtship, yes, it's the biblical model of courtship, but I, here's what I tell teenagers. You shouldn't be dating someone unless you're planning on looking to marry that person. And so anyway, his book, I Kiss Dating Goodbye, and I don't know, it was kind of self-righteous, but uh, this week he announced that he was leaving his wife. And a few days later he announced that he was leaving Christianity. That he was no longer a Christian. And so we were talking about this and someone says, how can someone like that lose their salvation? I says, people don't lose their salvation. They never had salvation in the first place. Jesus will lose none of his sheep. He will draw everyone that is given to him by the Father. And so listen, it looks in our cultural landscape like, like, oh man, things are getting bad, things are getting bad. My friend, things have always been bad since Adam and Eve ate the fruit and the world had sin in it. I was talking to another preacher and he says, yeah, whenever that happened, then uh, uh, God had to do plan B. I said, Jesus wasn't plan B. He's always plan A. The whole purpose of the universe to be created was so the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world would be revealed as the glorious Redeemer of humanity. Here's my big point. If you don't get nothing, if you don't care about dispensationalism and and eschatology and, and Jerusalem, listen. All these things Jesus described, none of it surprised Him. He's still going to get his church. He's going to gather them from the four winds. Okay. Now that we got the big idea, let's get a lot of the little nitpicky small ideas, okay? And uh, I'm planning on having fun today. Um, What we see in this passage, and I'm trying to use my... There it is. In this passage, that I, I said Jesus is not using new language talking about something that people have never heard about. All the language that Jesus uses here is things that come from the Old Testament. Specifically, Jesus uses apocalyptic language here for the destruction against a city or a nation. And I'm speaking specifically in verse 24 here, where it says, The sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, stars will be falling from heaven, the powers in heavens will be shaken. Oh, this sounds like cataclysmic terror! Well, that was frequently used on and on in the Old Testament. Whenever God was bringing judgment against a nation. 
So for example, Ezekiel 32, uh, uh, there's a prophecy and it says, Son of man, raise a lamentation over Pharaoh, king of Egypt. So this is a, a judgment against Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And what does it say? It says, when I blot you out, talking about Pharaoh, I will cover the heavens and make their stars dark. I will cover the sun with a cloud. The moon shall not give its light. All the bright lights of heaven I will make dark over you and put darkness over your land, declares the Lord God. So here we see this. the sun will be covered, the moon will be covered, all the lights of heaven will be covered. There's darkness over the land. It's a sign of God's judgment against a particular people. In Ezekiel 32. In Isaiah 13. The oracle concerning Babylon. So here we have now a specific people group. This is Babylon, a specific uh, territory, which Isaiah the son of Amos saw. Wail for the day of the Lord is near. Well, this is a long time ago in the Old Testament. This is a long time ago when they talked about the day of the Lord is near. This means judgment is coming upon Babylon. And what does it say? Behold, the day of the Lord comes, cruel with wrath and fierce anger, to make the land a desolation and to destroy its sinners from it. For the stars of the heavens and their constellations will not give their light. The sun will be dark. The moon will not shed its light. Behold, I'm stirring up the Medes against them. So this is a particular judgment. God is raising up an opposing nation against Babylon. And He says, I'm going to make the heavens dark. The stars are going to be dark. The sun's going to be dark. The moon's going to be dark. And these people are going to come against you. Verse 18, their bows will slaughter the young man. They will have no mercy on the fruit of the womb. Their eyes will not pity children in Babylon. The glory of kingdoms, the spender of pomp and Chaldeans will be like Sodom and Gomorrah when God overthrew them. So again, a particular judgment against a particular people group, which is called the day of the Lord, which is referenced with the sun and the moon and the stars and the constellations being blotted out and darkened. It's a sign of God removing His providential grace from this people group and unleashing the fury of His judgment, which is called the day of the Lord. Repeatedly in the Old Testament. It was not just a single event. It was something that happened whenever God judged a nation called the day of the Lord. And then Joel chapter 2, man, if you'll go home and you'll read Joel chapter 2 and you'll understand, as we, we looked at this last week, that the, the beginning of this verse is about the, the holy hill in Jerusalem and about, uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, the holy hill and, and Jerusalem. This is about God's judgment against Jerusalem. And it says, and I will show wonders in the heavens, on the earth, blood and fire and column of smokes. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. This is a specific judgment just like we had uh, uh, Pharaoh, Babylon, and then Jerusalem in Joel chapter 230. And it's called the day of the Lord when God judges a particular people group. Amen? So, this is not new language. And what we're seeing here in this verse... Verse 25, the powers in heaven will be shaken. All right, what does that mean? What does that mean that the powers in heaven will be shaken? It means that God is going to signify His wrath and His judgment through heavenly signs. And as I mentioned last week, there was a historian in the first century named Josephus who had no interest in confirming the words of Jesus as a judgment against Jerusalem. But he recorded everything that happened in 70 A.D. when Jerusalem was destroyed. Here's some of the things that he recorded. He said, before Jerusalem was destroyed, there was a star resembling a sword which stood over the city and a comet that continued a whole year. Well, what is a comet? Isn't it, don't we call it like a falling star? You know, I always thought it was literally when a star fell. When someone said, oh, look, a shooting star. I'm like, how does a star shoot? <laughs> does it have weapons or something? <laughs> but, when it says in verse 25, the stars will be falling from heaven. There was a star which was uh, resembling a sword which stood over the city and a comet that continued a whole year. It was a sword pointing over Jerusalem as a sign in the heaven for an entire year before their judgment. Don't you think God was showing in the heavens what He was going to do on Jerusalem? Again, this is Josephus. He's a Jew. He has no interest in confirming what Jesus said. 
When the people were coming great crowds to the Feast of Unlimited Bread on the eighth day of the month of Nisan, and at the ninth hour of the night, so a great light shone around the altar of the holy house that it appeared to be bright daytime, which light lasted for half an hour. And so it was the ninth hour of the night, which was uh, about 3 a.m. And at 3 a.m., there was a light that shone on the temple, on the altar, and it appeared as bright as daytime. In the middle of the night, God was doing wonders in the heavens, showing a sign of His judgment. Moreover, at the feast, which we call Pentecost, as the priests were going by, night into the inner temple as their custom was to perform their sacred ministrations, they said that in the first place they felt a quaking, or an earthquake, and heard a great noise, and after that they heard a sound of a great multitude saying, let us remove hence. That means let us get out of here. So they heard a sound after an earthquake that says, let us get out. Remember what Jesus said? Let the one who sees these things flee from Jerusalem. Flee from Judea and go to the mountains. And lastly, oh, hold on, let me see if we have one more. Oh, this is incredible. A certain prodigious and incredible phenomenon appeared. I suppose the account of it would seem to be a fable. We're not related by those that saw it. For before sunsetting, the chariots and troops of soldiers in their armor were seen running about the clouds and surrounding cities. So there's a sign in the heavens of troops and armies and soldiers running about in the clouds before Jerusalem was destroyed. Remember what Jesus said? He said, um, the powers in heaven will be shaken. And they see publicly the sign that these armies in heaven are running about over the cities in the clouds. So those publicly declared... That this foreshadowed the desolation that was coming upon them. Even Josephus realized that these heavenly signs were God's announcement of his judgment against Jerusalem. We covered that last week, but just wanted to touch on it again. So Jesus uses particular language um, about destruction against a city or a nation. Secondly, Jesus uses language from Daniel 7 about inheriting his kingdom. So verse 26 says, And then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. What does that mean? Does that mean he's going to come on the clouds when they see the Son of Man? Well, it could mean that. Or he could be using Old Testament vernacular, vocabulary, to signify something to his disciples about what happens as the ending of the Jerusalem prosperity is now being transferred over from the earthly kingdom to the heavenly kingdom. That was a mouthful, so let's look at some of these scriptures. <clears throat> Daniel 7.13 In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. That sounds familiar, right? And where does he come? He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. So he's coming on the clouds of heaven, but he's not coming to earth. He's coming to the Father. And he was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. And all nations and all peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. And his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. When was Jesus given authority? This is a, a, an actual question. Well, what did he say before the Great Commission? After the resurrection. All authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go. You see, he was given authority. He was given a kingdom. He was given rulership. He was given glory and sovereign power when he was resurrected from the dead. He is not waiting to sit on a throne. Jesus is on the throne. So a lot of people who interpret these passages think that sometime in the distant future, Jesus will rule over the earth. Well, what do you think he's doing now? Twiddling his thumbs? Dad, when can I get in there? He's already approached the Ancient of Days, already led into His presence, 
already given authority in all nations and peoples and language are worshiping Him. He has a dominion. It's everlasting. It won't pass away. And His kingdom that has been established on the resurrection of Christ will never be destroyed. And in Matthew's Gospel, Jesus says, um, You have said so, Jesus replied, but I say to you, from now on, You will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. So what does it mean from now on? Does it mean it's a one-time event or it continues happening? Right? If I say, uh, Brother Tommy, from now on, you're going to see me in Midland eating breakfast every morning at the crossroads, at Deanna's restaurant. You know where that is? From... Uh, yeah, yeah, you can you can meet me there. From now on, you will see me there. Does that mean he'll see me one time? That means he'll see me whenever he passes through there, right? So Jesus says, from now on, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One, coming on the clouds of heaven. What does that mean, clouds of heaven, from the Old Testament language? It means he is ruling over the universe. He is ruling from his heavenly throne. He is the one that has been given all authority. Seated at the right hand of the mighty one. He also says, Matthew 25, When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, He will sit on His glorious throne. So I ask you, is Jesus on the throne now? Yes. Yes. He's seated at the right hand of the Father. He was ruling over the universe as as all enemies are made a footstool under His feet. So when He comes in glory, He will sit on His throne. Well, Daniel 7 happens. Daniel 7 says that happens after the resurrection when He's approaching the Father and granted a dominion. This is something that has happened. He has already been granted the throne. This is what Jesus said earlier in Mark chapter 9. He said to them, truly, some of you are standing here who will not taste death before they see that the kingdom of God has come with power. See, the kingdom of God is not coming one day in the future. The kingdom of God came with Jesus Christ ushering in the covenant of grace through his blood. That is the kingdom of God. Jesus right now is ruling over his people. He is the Lord of not only the universe, but he is the Lord of those believers who Trust in Him and have a new spirit and have a new heart. They are the kingdom of God. We are the kingdom of God. And lastly, Jesus uses language about God preserving believers in the midst of destruction. So, in verse 27 it says, He will send out the angels and gather His elect from the four winds and from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. Well, let me ask you, what what is chapter 13 all about? Give Give me a word. What is chapter 13 about? Give me a word. Destruction. Judgment. Calamity. And here's the fear. How will we be rescued in the midst of destruction? Jesus says, I will gather you. I will be gathered you. So this language about gathering them from the four winds, what does that mean biblically? Uh, Again, Daniel 7 says... In my vision at night, I looked, and there before me were the four winds of heaven churning up the great sea. So, in the Old Testament, the four winds of heaven were a sign of what was causing calamity. The four winds are chaos, judgment, destruction. Right? They're not only directional arrows. They are a sign of God's force of destruction. In Revelation 7. After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds. Why do you have to hold back the winds? So it doesn't mess things up. Amen? That's why you don't put a screen door on a battleship or a submarine. You want something that's going to hold back the judgment. And so, uh, uh, these angels are holding back the four winds. Preventing any wind from blowing on the land or on on any of the trees. 
saying, Do not harm the land or the sea or the trees until we put a seal on the foreheads of the servants of our God. That means the judgment will not prevent Jesus from saving His elect. There will never be judgment in the earth that will take away any of those who should be saved from Jesus' kingdom. So when Jesus says, I will send out my angels and gather, elect my, uh, gather His elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven, He's saying, none of this judgment, none of this destruction is going to ruin those who the Father has called. None of this destruction will prevent God from drawing to Him those who are given to the Son. And that's what this verse concludes with here in verse 27. And also Joel 2, which I told you is about the destruction of Jerusalem. It finally says, for in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be those who escape. As the Lord has said, and among the survivors shall be those whom the Lord calls. So all this tribulation is not going to destroy the body of Christ. All of this persecution and judgment will not destroy the body of Christ. Uh, of Christ. That's true then, and it will be true through church history. When Nero persecuted all the Christians, killed all the Christians, martyred all the Christians, the kingdom of God did not stop advancing. My friend, I want you to know something. Death is not the weapon of Satan against the church. Death does not prevent Jesus' kingdom from advancing. And so, we see that those who escape from Jerusalem are those whom are called by the Lord. And why has Jesus given us this passage to his disciples, he's telling them, stay awake. When you see all these things, stay awake so that you may flee from judgment. All right? So that's the really fine, detailed things. Now let's make some closing points. He concludes with another illustration about the fig tree. If you'll remember chapter 11, when he goes to the temple, that's when he immediately sees the fig tree that does not have fruit. You remember that? Say amen. He goes to the temple, it says it's very late, so he can't do anything. He goes and sees the fig tree. It has no fruit because it wasn't the time for figs. And then he curses it. Says you'll never give fruit again. Well, I mean, a fig tree that doesn't have figs when it's not supposed to be in season, well, how can you blame it? But Jesus is symbolically judging Jerusalem. They will no longer be the center place of mankind's access to God. It won't happen for the temple. It won't happen through Jerusalem anymore. And now he concludes this with another illustration of the fig tree. When you see these things, um, know that summer is near. When you see these things taking place, know that he is near. And then I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Which is why, again, I've said that this chapter has to do with what took place in that generation. Does it have forward-looking connotation. Certainly it does, and in the rest of the Bible, it occurs many times. But these things, which take place in that generation, they were warned about them, and they fled Jerusalem, and they were saved from destruction. And then lastly, he gives this charge of warnings. No one knows the day or the hour, not even the angels in heaven nor the sun. That would be true of the destruction of Jerusalem. It's also true of when the end of time will be. No one knows the day or the time. What that means is, it is unfruitful to try to put together a timetable to figure out when the end will be. And false prophets are signified by people predicting the end. Charles Taze Russell of the uh, Jehovah's Witness movement predicted it three separate times. The end will be here, the end will be here. Never came true. Well, the Old Testament says if they make a false uh, if they make a prophecy and it's false, don't listen to them. Well, how did he start a religion? I'm going to tell you what, man. People like getting all stirred up about calamity. That's why most of the news is bad news. Turn off the bad news, find some good news, my friends. The good news, no matter how bad it gets out there, Jesus is still in control. He's still saving his church. He still wins. 
So since we don't know the end, since they didn't know the end of uh, Jerusalem, we don't know the, the end of time. That means we got to live in light of not knowing. It could be tomorrow. It could be tomorrow. My wife gave a, a, a very somber reminder that we don't know when we'll have any more opportunities to witness. But we don't know when our end will be. We don't know when the end will be. We don't know when their end will be. And we must live as if each day could be our last that we're given to be a witness for Jesus Christ on this earth. And if the end is tomorrow, have we shared the gospel? If the end is tomorrow, have we witnessed to every tribe, tongue, nation, and language? There's still 6,000 people groups who haven't heard. I, I personally, based on scripture, don't think that, that the end will come until all those 6,000 people groups will hear. But, but listen. I mean, as far as Apostle Paul was concerned, he thought the gospel had been preached to every corner of the world in his lifetime. It says in Acts that the gospel had been preached in every corner of the world based on what he knew. So it could be tomorrow. We don't know. So don't be alarmed when things get bad, when there's wars. Be on your guard when you see false prophets. There's been false prophets for 2,000 years. They're not going to stop. They're going to keep continuing. Stay awake. Live as a soldier who knows that the enemy could approach. It means we must live diligently and not as the world lives, carelessly, but with purpose, with intention. Remember, I said if you don't get anything, just know. When everything is falling apart, Jesus still wins. He is on His throne. He is ruling and reigning over the universe. And he is worthy of our worship. Amen, church? Let's pray. Father, You have given Your Son all authority as the incarnate God-man